The title of my talk has been inspired by um, the, the presence of gentlemen from Brazil uh, at this, this, this conference. Uh, and this reminded me that a few years back there was a very successful meme in, uh, in, in Brazil uh, which said less um, Marx, more Mises. Menos Marx, mas Mises. I cannot pronounce it really the Brazilian way, but you, you get it, right? <laughs> And it's, it's a funny way of uh, uh, concisely stating this, even if you're not an expert uh, of uh, the work of Karl Marx or of the work of Ludwig von Mises, at least you know by and large what they stand for. So you're on safe grounds and saying, well, I want less of this and more of, uh, of the other uh, guy, of the other direction. It also reminds me then of uh, uh, an anecdote of my, my, my early years, so even before I got to the doctorate, I was studying in France and um, it, I, was, uh, I had signed up for a, a research class, so we were initiated to uh, research techniques and so on, and each of us had to work finally on a research project. So I presented my research project and then the director, he looked at me in bewilderment. There was a silence. I grew very nervous. And he opened his mouth and said, I don't understand anything. <laughs> Which is what research directors sometimes should tell their students. I just politely said, it's not clear. I believe I, yeah, this made no sense at all. And then he asked me, what kind of economics do you want to do? Like Sombart or like Mises? That's the same kind of question, right? And I had studied neither Sombart nor Mises. <laughs> At that point, it was 1991 or something like this. Uh, but I knew what Zombot stood for and I knew what Mises stood for. And then I said, well, I guess more like Mises. <laughs> then he said, well, then why don't you do what's necessary to get this on the rails? Yeah. And then one of the things, of course, that I did not write after this, but eventually, a few months later, I started reading Mises. So this was the be beginning of a very long-lasting love affair. So we have here uh, less Mauss, more Mises. Uh, uh, Mauss uh, refers to Marcel Mauss, uh, who is a French uh, sociologist, anthropologist, uh, was the uh, son-in-law of uh, Emile Durkheim, who was uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, luminaries of, of, of sociology of a certain type. Of course, there were other sociologists before uh, Durkheim, but he became famous most notably because he uh, tried to construe social analysis on grounds uh, diametrically opposed to economics. Right? There were different types of sociology in the 19th century. You had people like uh, Herbert Spencer, who were uh, not only familiar with economics, but who thought that economics should play, of course, a decisive role in, in social analysis. If we want to understand how society, what society is, how it evolves throughout time and so on. But others, uh, were very uncomfortable with the libertarian conclusions that economists typically drew from their analysis, and so they thought the problem is economics per se. And they therefore set out to construe social analysis by excluding economics and on grounds so that it would lead to other uh, conclusions. One famous case was uh, uh, Auguste Comte, who was often called the father of sociology because he used the word sociology for the first time in the mid 19th century. Uh, but then there were uh, other, um, uh, many others uh, uh, that followed. So Durkheim and Mauss are part of, of that uh, tradition. Mauss became famous uh, for a book, um, and I think it's, 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 his, it's his only book, that he published in 1925 uh, uh, with the title Le Don, Essay sur le Don, Essay on the Gift. So we have here a picture of both uh, Mauss. He looks a little mousy. And, uh, and, and, and his book. And the book had an enormous impact on uh, 20th century anthropology and 20th century uh, sociology. And uh, as I will explain in more detail later on, the, the funny thing uh, about the, a book with this title, or the, the book with this book with this title was that in fact he explained why such a thing like, uh, as, the, as the gift uh, cannot exist and does not exist. It's quite funny. Well, I'll explain this to you in, in some more detail. And then I'll explain to you also why um, we are more, much more solid grounds uh, in developing an economics of gifts uh, if we base ourselves on uh, Ludwig von Mises' work on, on praxeology, uh, which I have done in the, in the 
in the past few months, uh, past uh, yeah, uh, year and a half or so. And so I'm currently writing on a uh, finishing a book uh, that deals with the economics of gratuitousness. So gratuitous goods that come most notably in the form of uh, gifts, but also in the unintentional form. Eco economists sometimes call this the positive external effects. So it's a general theory of gifts and positive ex external effects, right? a, a, a theory of gratuitousness. And I was drawn to this more or less by accident because it was really not uh, the, my main focus of research, but um, I had been invited to, to comment on um, Benedict the Sixteenth, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth, uh, encyclica uh, Caritas in Veritate, uh, Love in Truth, uh, in which the Pope uh, highlights the importance of gratuitous goods, most notably spiritual goods such as love, uh, hope, and, and, and so on, uh, and uh, also emphasized that uh, gratuitous goods uh, are part of the human economy and they should play probably a, a, a greater role. So I've been invited, many other economists have also commented on, on this encyclical and try to uh, well, develop a more systematic way of thinking about uh, gifts. So the, the book, my book, is, uh, is, is, is a result of this. It just got a little bit out of hand. At first I, I thought I would pop just have a little manuscript of what, about 50 pages or so, now it's become much more bigger. I hope you will be able to buy it next year or so. Oh, no, wait, 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 before I get to this. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, I'll this no, this is actually the wrong. I'll, I need to switch back to this later. Okay. In order to understand the impact of uh, Marcel Mauss, it's first necessary to consider that indeed by 1925, uh, gifts and gratuitous goods had played virtually uh, no role or no significant role in standard economics. And here it is especially the uh, very nefarious influence of British economics that is uh, responsible uh, for the state of affairs. Uh, and Adams, well, I mean, it's, it's a matter of fact. Um, Adam Smith had, uh, in, in The Wealth of Nations, it's a very uh, uh, important book, uh, but also important in size, uh, on, the, on the 600 or 800 pages of the edition that I use, uh, the, the word gratuitous does not occur, or it occurs, I think, a, a single time. And only to explain that, well, there is no such thing as a gratuitous good. And Adam Smith held that in a, uh, in a, in a natural economy, under conditions of natural liberty, uh, all goods sell at their cost. Right? All the, the, the prices tend to be equal to cost of production. So it's impossible uh, to um, provide anything gratuitously uh, to other people. Okay, the, you might have uh, gifts uh, among friends and so on, so that's fine, but that does not relate to the production of goods, right? So it's impossible to obtain a good without um, uh, paying the price. And if you obtain a good with a, without paying its full price, its cost of production, where well, something fishy going on. Right? And either the equilibrium has not yet been reached, or there's some, some fraud, or something like this. And this uh, pretty much also, the, the same stance so, uh, you find in, in David Ricardo and you find it at the end of the 19th century uh, in uh, the, the marginalist economics uh, of uh, Leon Vairas and uh, Stanley Jevons. Right? So they have in their conceptions no place for gifts. Right? Gifts are not part of the uh, market economy. Gifts do not uh, spontaneously result uh, or gratuitous goods do not spontaneously result from uh, market activities. Now there was a, a different approach um, that came to very different results, uh, namely the approach that we find in the, in the French school of political economy. So not the British tradition, but the French tradition. And in the French tradition, indeed, gratuitous goods played an important role, even a central role. Uh, the, the physiocrats said that all wealth ultimately re resulted from nature. So human beings, by and large, just transform the wealth that they find in nature, but they do not create wealth. Um, and the wealth that we gain from nature is gratuitous. We do not produce the substances that we find in the ground. We do not produce the laws of nature and so on. All of this comes to us gratuitous. And it's not of our making. We just are beneficiaries of these goods that come from nature. And uh, uh, this was then, this conception, well, so this was of the physiocrats uh, um, uh, 
So people like Francois Quenet and, uh, and, and, and others in the mid uh, eight, uh, 18th century. And um, then Jean Baptiste Say, who was of course a disciple of, of Smith, he, um, he adopted essentially the, the approach of Smith, but he maintained some of the notions of the physiocrats. So uh, Jean-Baptiste Say held that uh, there are gratuitous goods and they play a very important role in the economy. Only, according to him, uh, these goods are not the object of political economy, because in political economy we are only, only dealing with those things that cost. Okay. Then after Say, the, the uh, one economist who has probably done the most to um, develop an economics of gratuitous goods was Frédéric Bastiat. Now I could as well uh, give, give a talk on Frédéric Bastiat, I will not. Um, Bastiat made crucial contributions, especially in highlighting the positive e external effects, that is the unintended gratuitous goods that result from the market process, in particular from processes like capital accumulation. Right. If you uh, uh, have a, f a few generations of, of people who save a lot of their income and they are therefore able to invest this income and build up a capital structure, then all other people benefit from them. All other people who have done nothing to, con uh, to, to create those goods, but they are able to reap the benefits of those goods because as a consequence of capital investment, you have machines, you have infrastructure, you have a road system and so on, suddenly you are able to obtain tomatoes and shoes and lambs and so on at much lower prices than it would have been possible with uh, artisanal uh, production and so on, so purely hand production, right? So this was the crucial point stressed by Bastiat and a few others around the mid uh, 19th century. But then this uh, was completely forgotten and economists uh, set out to construe economics without gifts, right? On very shaky foundations. One, one way uh, this was being done, one way to forget that there's always a gratuitous element, gratuitous benefit in market activity. One basic example would be uh, in exchange, right? If two people exchange, each one of them is giving up something that for him is less important than the thing that he receives. Right? It's the basic uh, theorem in, in the theory of exchange, one that has been highlighted by Kondiak and then especially by Karl Menger and by later economists. Now, if we consider this basic fact, then we see, well, in each exchange, there is a gratuitous element, something that, I mean, it's not the case that you pay exactly for all that you receive. You always receive more than what you pay, at least from your own point of view. There's always a win-win situation. Right? And this com uh, was completely uh, neglected, and the systematic reflection on, on facts like this was uh, neglected. So economics developed without gifts. Comes in, uh, Marcel Mauss, uh, Durkheim and, uh, and others, who now set out to study gifts without economics. And uh, Mauss, uh, in distinct contrast to his uh, father-in-law Durkheim, he had a more empirical bent. So he went to um, uh, uh, Polynesia, uh, following up on another uh, Western uh, researcher by the name of Bronislav Malinowski, and so he's studying the behavior of the tribes, of the primitive tribes that he finds there. So why would he be interested in doing this? It might be just out of uh, curiosity, what are these people doing and so on. But for them, the whole project had a, had a larger, more transcendent meaning. They were, in a way, they were Rousseauists. I mean, he doesn't quote Rousseau, but the, the whole approach, uh, the, the, the tacit, the implicit hypothesis was Rousseauist. Rousseau had held that primitive society was glorious and natural and good and healthy, and everything got screwed up when we developed civilization based on private property. From then on, it went downhill, down the hill, well, not actually in material terms, but uh, certainly moral terms and uh, healthy social relationships and so on. Um, that was the Rousseauist hypothesis. So if you believe that there is some truth to this, then it might be interesting to study the conditions, uh, the behavior of primitive people because you might learn something that is of lasting value for your own society. Because in our own societies, of course, we have for many centuries and millennia, we have uh, based our interactions on the uh, institution of private property, so in a way we are perverted. Right? We no longer count, right? Our, 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 our thoughts are, and our, our habits are screwed up, right? By too much exposition to the poison. 
Let's turn back to the mainspring of, of healthy relationships and s study those tribes. Now, the observation that uh, Moss made, um, one of the observations that he made that inspired his book was, in these tribes, they have no notion of gifts. Now, we come to the point that I, I wish to highlight. Right? He publishes the, uh, this book, uh, Essay on the Gift, in which he explains that under natural conditions, there are no gifts. Okay? There are no gifts. Uh, whatever people do, uh, they, they, they cannot, uh, um, uh, in, and to make it, make it short, right, because I, I need to make sure that I say everything is essential, right, the, the essential reason is that they have no property rights. You see, you can make a gift only if uh, out of something that you own, right? So it presupposes a gift is something that you give beyond what you owe. And if I pay a price uh, to, to a baker and so on, well, I owe him the sum of money because I wish to have the bread as part of our deal. Right? Um, I owe uh, maybe uh, protection services to my children, to my wife, and so on. So this is not a gift that I provide, but it's something that uh, due to my status as a husband, as a father, and so on, that, that I owe. So this is not a gift. But if I do something beyond this, that's a gift. I give a smile to a complete stranger. Uh, I give a sum of money to a beggar and so on. So I don't owe him anything, but I, uh, it's precisely why I make a gift. I can make a gift only because I own what I give. My time, my money, and so on. It's my time, it's my money. Right? If I didn't own it, if let's say the money in my pocket is just objects of paper and so on floating around. It just so happens to be in my paper, but I'm just the uh, current carrier of these objects, but really it's part of common property. You, All of you, and uh, even the people beyond this room, in some way have a, a, a claim uh, on these objects. Well, then I could not really give them to, in, in, in the strict sense uh, to anybody else because, first of all, it would be kind of uh, wrong that I unilaterally decide how, uh, how to use them. Um, and uh, you, you would not be fully entitled to, to do this. So how uh, is it in, in, in a primitive society? In a primitive society, everything is ruled by uh, custom and by generation overlapping relationships of claims and obligations. Everybody is indebted to, to some extent to all other people, to which extent is ruled by custom and how things have always been done. So it's not you yourself who make any decision uh, whatsoever, and you could not because you don't own actually anything. Right? And therefore, uh, he also comes to a methodological point, right? You cannot analyze, um, cannot perform social analysis meaningfully by observing and starting from individual behavior. It makes no sense because individual behavior is embedded in a network of claims and obligations that overreach the individual and they're overlapping and have always been there, are unending without beginning, without end. Okay? So you have to study social reality as a whole, as a totality. You cannot just pick on a, a part of uh, that social reality and build your analysis from there. Right? It, goes, it goes very far. Now, let me give you a little quote from, uh, from Moss. Oh, okay, uh, last, the last point, right, so that, that follows from is that, um, so this, this is how things stand in a natural, primitive society. Now we come with our civilization, and this civilization creates property rights and is based on property rights, is built on property rights. Now according to Moss, is this has just partially supplanted the natural order that is still lingering under the surface. Right? We have instituted these legal institutions, law, contract, and so on, but this is just a legal blah blah, it's a legal fiction, right? an uh, uh, intellectual superstructure, as Marx would say. And, but the underlying reality is that, well, there, is no, uh, clear, there are no clear cut property rights, there are only claims and obligations that embed everybody in an unending flow. Um, so, as a consequence, these natural relationships still subsist. And uh, we are screwing up with the artificial modern institutions of property contract and so on. And the appropriate way, uh, what we should do is to get rid of them. And the way to get rid of them is by reverting back to the natural order as far as possible, most notably through social legislation and so on. So creating welfare states and uh, other forms of collective 
production and distribution of goods. So this is this quote. Uh, all our social uh, insurance legislation, a piece of state socialism that has already been realized, now of course he thinks that's great, is inspired by the following principle. The worker has given his life and his labor on the one hand to the uh, collectivity and on the other hand to his employers. Right? So it's not just a deal, right? you sign a contract, that's just a legal fiction. Right? This is a modern superstition that we believe that it's just a contract with the employer. Uh, he has given to society, and today we'll say is also given to the little birds and to the, uh, the insects and whatever else is crawling around in nature. Although the worker has to contribute to his insurance, those who have benefited from his services have not discharged their debt to him through the payment of wages. It's just something that they've made up on, on their own. It's just a, a fiction. The state itself, representing the community, owes him, as do his employers, together with some assistance from himself, a certain security in life against unemployment, sickness, old age, and death. Right? So what we have here then is this, this whole uh, research uh, program, which is based on the hypothesis, implicit hypothesis, as it out, is in fact amounts to a full-blown vindication of the of the welfare state. Okay, so that's the whole point. Now, um, th this approach uh, is, uh, uh, well, can be criticized on, 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 uh, on various grounds. Um, the, the most important one is, is, is of course, well, that uh, uh, private property rights are, are just not impositions uh, that, that come from out of space or uh, come just from the government, uh, just uh, perverting the operation of a, a natural society, private property contract and so on, are very old institutions. It's true that they have not existed uh, at, um, at all times and so on, but certainly um, they have existed as far as civilization goes. Right? And from uh, both observation and theory, we know that private property rights has not been instituted by uh, the state, but has grown uh, from bottom up by people who just wanted to solve daily problems. That's the very point of Karl Menger's theory of the spontaneous emergence of social institutions, right? uh, which, he, which he presented in 1883. Right? Uh, so it's pe because people realize that collective property leads to problems such as the tragedy of the commons, right? that overconsumption of, of a collective good, that they start privatizing those goods, even though in the short run it might mean that they are being deprived, right? therefore private property, deprived uh, of uh, free access to goods that previously were accessible to all of them. Right? You have uh, so some meadow and, and so on was previously accessible to everybody, but the point is, as long as you have just a few users, I mean, uh, you can very well have a collective meadow, but as soon as people start starting to build up uh, big herds, and so the animals are trampling down the grass and so on, then finally it doesn't help you to have free access to something that is no longer a good. Right. So whereas if you institute private property, well, you, you get actually um, uh, more of that good. So uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's not factually correct to say that um, uh, uh, this, um, the private property order has been imposed uh, top down. And then of course one thing that Moss never does is to consider the advantages that come uh, along with um, uh, with this order. Right? Like many uh, sociologists after him, he would uh, implicitly uh, presuppose or consider that all the goods that, that currently exist, well, they, they are just there, right? They are the result of productive forces that, that do their work without uh, uh, being dependent on a private property on an exchange order. So all these goods are just there uh, and we just need to distribute them uh, differently. It's very unsatisfactory and it's, it's just a, a, a wrong. Uh, conclusion. So we need, when it comes to, to gifts, we need to forget uh, Mao's, uh, I think, and we need to build the an an analysis of gifts on foundations that are much more realistic and uh, especially that can rely on those elements that have been developed by Frederick Bastiat and by, by Mises in particular. So we have the economics of gifts. The economics of gifts must be built on uh, the, the institution of, of private property. Right? It's, it's a very important point. There is no such thing as a gift where there are no private property rights. Right? A gift is always something that is 
transmitted in excess of what is owed. And that what is owed must be limited. Right? If claims and obligations are unlimited, if I have unlimited claims and obligations on all wealth that exists in the world, well, I could not obtain a gift because everything would be owed to me in the first place, right? to some extent. Nobody could give me a gift. Right? And if I uh, owed to everybody in the world, to you in the room and everywhere else, all things that I, I have, to some extent at least, well, I could not make a, make a gift because uh, I owe you anyway. Right? So it wouldn't be a gift, it would just be a payment or a, a settlement of a social uh, relationship, sh social bond that uh, isn't of my own making. So gifts, this very charming institution, and in fact one of the most important, one of the most human uh, phenomena, right? There are no gifts among lions or, or ants or, or whatever other crawling uh, beasts, right? There, there's no such thing as a gift. It's, it's eminently human. Uh, it's that what allows us to support people who cannot help themselves is through a gift, right? Small children, old people, handicapped people, and so on. They rely on gifts. Right? A developed market economy must rely on gifts because we are all mortal, right? So we cannot make it beyond our death. So if we want to build up production structures that are lasting, right, and, and, and geared toward the satisfaction of generations of future uh, consumers, well, we need to bequeath at some point. Uh, that property. Right? So we make a gift to somebody. We cannot exchange with that person. Right? We need to give. So private property is fundamental. And then I will, in, in the few minutes that remain, just uh, give a few, uh, two, well, it's two uh, important examples. One has already been mentioned implicitly. Uh, there are several elements of an economics of uh, gratuitous goods that we find in Mises. One is his insistence that we as um, inheritors of uh, civilization, we are the lucky heirs of previous generations, right? So it's related to this inheritance necessity, uh, to the importance of the capital structure and so on. We didn't create it. Uh, was, was this hotel, was it built by your family? But you didn't build it, right? Exactly, right? So, uh, you, uh, and, and you didn't pay for it and so on, you, 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 you received it, right? Uh, and so it is with most other things. I always tell my students, just look around in our town. We have, so we have a town that goes back to, to Roman times. You have uh, even buildings that are still left from, from Roman times. So, well, look, I mean, we are the lucky heirs right, of all the generations who built it up before us and then transmitted it. All we have to do is just to keep it up as well as we can. Another uh, important example is Mises' theory of the creative genius. Mises has reflected a lot on, uh, on the social significance of the, uh, the creative genius. The creative genius is a person who pursues um, an artistic or scientific enterprise uh, just for the merits of this work itself. He doesn't seek a compensation out of this. He doesn't, he's not a professional, right? He's not a professional economist who uh, wants to turn a buck on becoming good at knowing statistics and economic theory and so on. He is interested in the science itself. He wants to promote the science itself. Uh, our colleague, uh, Joe Salerno in, in the US, he has written a very nice essay, you can look this up on the internet, on the difference between a vocational and a professional economist. Very nice uh, piece in which he highlights uh, the, the different mental attitude. Now, in, in the case of creative genius, of course, we have, we're talking here not just about people who are doing uh, things for their own merit, but who are particularly good at, at doing this. Right? People like Mozart and Bach and, uh, and Goethe and, and uh, Shakespeare and so on. So all of humanity benefits from it, and there's no exchange between them and, and humanity. Okay, they might sell a few of, of their books and so on, but the benefits that derive from it, I mean, you, can, you cannot, it's not part of exchange, it's something that spontaneous realize, it's not an intended benefit, right? So they are, they are pursuing these activities out of love for the subject itself, but the benefits that result from other people from it, though unintended, are very real. So they're gratuitous goods springing from the activity of the creative genius. And then, of course, there are uh, other elements that are also helpful, such as uh, helpful for the construction of a theory of false gifts. Right? False gifts are very current. For example, in, in uh, uh, marketing, advertising, and so on, it, uh, you always see people say, here you buy one and you get one free. 
right? <laughs> okay, that's a false gift because what it really amounts to is, is a price reduction, right? We will sell at half the price, but just oh, there's nothing free there, right? And there are also completely false gifts, like all the handouts that come from the welfare state, but also uh, the, 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 uh, the, the gratuitous credit, right? Mises uh, and Bastiat, they could not imagine negative interest rates. Right, which we have today. Negative interest rates mean actually that you are being paid for getting into debt. <laughs> okay, that's what it means. Now, is this a gift? Well, to make it short, it's not, right? As we know, because uh, although the money might come for free and you might actually get paid for taking it, uh, the goods that you can buy with it do not come for free, right? So uh, it's in fact it's a forced redistribution in favor of the beneficiaries uh, of such a scheme, and that's uh, very easy to see if you know the economics of Frederick Bastiat and Ludwig von Mises. And in that sense, I should say yes, we need less Mores and more Mises. Thank you for your attention.